When did you not just dodge a bullet, but evade a full-on ballistic missile strike? Just after high school, I was dating this girl. And early on, my friend at the time got her to dump me for him. What ended up happening might have been the worst two years of his life as he dealt with insane drama. Her stealing hundreds of dollars from him and his family. And cheated on him, repeatedly giving him an infection. After he finally got away from her, she came back a few months later and stalked him. I heard all of this well after the fact from him. So I know it's not just gossip. I couldn't be mad about it anymore after that. I wish him well. In 2004, I moved back to New Orleans and chose an apartment. After five weeks of dealing with terrible neighbors and unresponsive management, I moved to another apartment in a different building. When Hurricane Katrina hit, my initial apartment flooded, and the other option had its roof ripped off. My new place was undamaged, saving me from a drastically different and challenging life situation. We were booked to go on a cruise around New Zealand in December 2019, including a day tour to a volcano. However, our car had a massive engine issue, and we decided to cancel the trip. While at work, reports started coming in about the volcano's explosive eruption, which resulted in many casualties and severe injuries. If our car hadn't needed work, we would have been on that tour. There was a long abandoned theater in my town next to a friend's apartment building, and one bored afternoon we jimmied open a rusty fire door to marvel at the decay. The roof had been letting in rain and snow for years. Everything was mildew, pigeon droppings, and soft, spongy wood. One friend stepped on a rotted spot on the stage, and his leg went through, so we steered well clear of the stage. Other than that, we treaded softly. We were explorers, not vandals. The building was making some amazing creaking noises, and the ammonia from the pigeon droppings was cloying, so we retreated back to the friend's apartment to relax. We'd been in his living room for less than 20 minutes when there was a great f wump, and the whole building shook, rattling the windows and the dishes in his sink. We ran back downstairs to investigate, everything suddenly thick with dust and the smell of mildew and ammonia. The boarded-up entry to the theater was in shambles, as though the building had exploded very softly. As it turned out, the roof had finally given up, taking out much of the back wall of the theater with it, save for softening up the stage a little. There was nothing we'd done that, I would guess, had precipitated the collapse. It was just a long time coming, and finally happened. We'd been debating exploring the upstairs and balcony, though the stage had put us off by the idea of rotten floors and stairs. If we'd stuck around much longer, we would have been in the building when it collapsed. I was traveling in Australia and stayed with a guy for a week or two. Initially, he seemed like the coolest person, but I quickly realized he was a heavy alcoholic and a drug dealer who had recently been in prison. One night while I was out, he got completely drunk and caused a scene at the apartment complex, prompting the police to be called. I returned to find cop cars everywhere. Fed up, I booked a flight for the next morning to another city. In the morning, I hurriedly packed my clothes and was about to leave without saying goodbye. But I thought that would be rude. I started writing a thank you note to the guy for letting me stay. While writing the note, he woke up and came into the common room. I apologized and mentioned I found a cheap flight leaving soon. He asked, can I see your bag really quick before you leave? I think I left something in there. The man had hidden his stash of illegal substances in my bag when the police arrived the night before. I hadn't noticed it in my rush to pack and leave. I was about to board an airplane with illegal substances unknowingly. If I hadn't decided to write that goodbye note, I would have faced serious legal trouble abroad. At 19, I had an offer to mentor under one of the top film colorists in the industry and had my first offer to color an indie film at 175 pounds per HR. At 19, the most I had made was 4,000 pounds in sales. I didn't like entertainment as an industry. From the odd hours, to the rampant disrespect and entitlement, to the social requirement of getting work in entertainment. It does, however, feed the ego to name drop celebrities, studios, films. That wasn't enough for me. I knew if I said yes, I'd be stuck. Because the money was so good. I said no and went back to school. My dad disowned me over the choice. One or two years later, Apple added color to Final Cut Pro, forcing most colorists to retire or become editors, compositors, since all editors could now do basic color for very cheap. For reference, the A-list colorists I worked with were making from one to 2,000 per hour before color features were added to most editing software. I used to be a nurse. I worked 12-hour night shifts with a one-hour commute add time to get and give report, and I was gone 15 hours three days in a row. I do long stretches of 3 on 2 off, 3 on 2 off, 3 on 8 off. I have epilepsy, and it turns out that schedule was not good for my brain. 
One morning, the last before my 8-off stretch, I was having the hardest time focusing well enough to give a report, so I was running late, and then I suddenly dropped to the floor at the exact time I would have usually been pulling onto the highway. I was medically cleared to drive at the time. I seized, grand mal, for 7 minutes, wasn't breathing for 5. Had I not been on an intensive care unit with two shifts of nurses and respiratory therapists available, I would have died. In my car, alone on a busy highway, taking who knows how many people in other cars with me. I was in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, during terrorist bombings in 2005. When the bombs went off, we were in a jewelry shop and it was the only shop with windows that didn't shatter from the explosions. Literally moments before, a five-year-old me had my face pressed against a toy shop window, eyeing up some that I wanted. My cousin called me into the shop moments before an explosion went off. The KFC we were in 20 minutes before was the location where the first bomb went off. I was so young and I saw people with limbs missing walking around. All I could think is, where is Spider-Man? He's usually here when things like this happen. I never really reflect on how much impact that day had upon me, but it was a crazy experience to look back upon. Almost can't believe I experienced it at times. I planned a casual relationship with a girl over the summer, but she suddenly stopped responding. Months later, I learned she had undiagnosed HIV and had accidentally passed it to someone else. At the time, I wasn't practicing safe intimacy, which could have led to a severe consequence for me. This experience changed my approach to safe intimacy. Father's instinct. I was feeling unwell after a meeting, and a friend insisted on taking me to the doctor. The doctor immediately sent me to the emergency room for suspected appendicitis. I had just come back from a dive weekend, and if my appendix had burst during one of the deep dives, I probably wouldn't have survived. While staying at a hotel, I decided to take the stairs instead of the elevator because I wanted to get some exercise. Moments after I started walking down, I heard a loud crash. The elevator I was about to take had malfunctioned and crashed to the ground floor. Luckily, no one was injured, but it was a terrifying close call. I was living in Brooklyn and usually bought donuts from the World Trade Center before heading to work. One Tuesday, I overslept and took the subway instead. It was 9, 11. I would have been at World Trade Center during the first impact, but instead, I witnessed the events unfold from a distance, narrowly avoiding the tragedy. I was hiking in a remote forest and got separated from my group. As I was trying to find my way back, I heard rustling in the bushes. I quickly climbed a tree, and moments later, a large bear emerged from the bushes. It sniffed around and eventually left, but it was a close encounter that could have ended very badly. During a flight, I was offered a seat upgrade to first class but declined because I wanted to stay with my friend in economy. Mid-flight, the first class cabin experienced a sudden depressurization, and passengers there had to use oxygen masks and received medical attention upon landing. My decision to stay with my friend kept me safe. I briefly talked to an older man who let me try some recreational substances and flirted with me. When I refused to be his girlfriend, he started stalking me. I had to move twice and change my number. It turned out he was a pimp trying to take advantage of me. I moved far away, escaping a potentially dangerous situation. At work, I was asked to help move some hazardous chemicals. Feeling uneasy, I declined and suggested using proper safety equipment. Moments later, a container spilled and caused a small fire. The proper equipment contained the situation, and my refusal to participate likely saved me from injury. I was living in California and planned to visit a friend in another city. My plans changed last minute due to a work emergency, and I stayed home. That weekend, a major earthquake hit the city I was supposed to visit, causing significant damage and casualties. I would have been in the epicenter if I had gone. I used to go to a convenience store late at night for snacks. One evening, I felt unusually tired and decided to skip the trip. The next morning, I found out that the store had been robbed at gunpoint around the time I usually visited. My fatigue potentially saved me from a dangerous situation.